And joining us now, the new leader of the Ontario Federation of Labour, there's Sid Ryan. Welcome back to TVO. It's great to be here, Sid. You've been on the job one day. This is day two. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, we're happy we're <laughs> a part of your agenda today. You represent now 700,000 workers. For you, what's job one? Um, trying to get a message across to the Ontario government um, that they've got to get into, in a serious way, job creation programs. Um, don't give up on the manufacturing sector in Ontario. We think we can bring that back. Um, taking a look at the greening of the economy, the new jobs, um, not only in not only in energy fields, but public transportation, for example, is a, is a huge area. Um, I, I have a major problem on my hands, um, you know, to try to unite the entire labour movement in Ontario. Um, we've been fractured in the past, but it's actually moving to a point now where, um, you know, I've got very good relations with Ken Luenza from the CAW. And, um, they're I'm hoping out, just so people know they're, they're out. They're, they're out, and, um, but Ken has talked over Christmas time um, publicly about coming back in again, so I'm hoping to be able to, uh, to bring that home. And then finally, I need to be able to be out there talking to people who don't belong to the labour movement, um, people who don't have pension plans, 60% of the population, for example, um, people who are um, injured, on, injured on the job, uh, for example, like that uh, tragic accident just before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're killing people on the jobs, uh, about 400 a year in Ontario, 317,000 accidents. Um, I want to you know, put that on the map and say, let's stop the carnage in the workplace. Um, let's get back to a time where um, you know, workers can go to work and come home uh, safe in the evenings. Okay, let's unpack some of all of that. I guess when you were the head of CUPE, the Public Employees Union, a lot of what you did was negotiating contracts. Do you, you're not going to do that anymore, I guess, are you? Um, I'm not, no, but actually I spent a lot of my time at, at CUPE. CUPE is a bit of a federation as well. They've got about a thousand locals across the province. Um, and now I'm in a federation where I'm dealing with other larger unions. So uh, the, a lot of the work is pretty similar. I spent a lot of my time at Queen's Park uh, lobbying um, and uh, we have staff that we hire to do negotiations. So I wasn't so much involved in the nuts and bolts of negotiations okay. as I was in dealing with the political agenda. People will, however, certainly remember you for the many high profile and let's say uh, either controversial or uh -huh. uh, you know, radical, call it what you will, some people will characterize them in their own ways. Uh, positions on various issues, for example, you tried to lead a boycott against you know, participation with Israeli universities. Can Ontario Federation of Labour members expect that Sid Ryan to continue? Um, I think, you know, when you take a look at the fights I've had, um, I've had major battles with the Bob Ray government over opening up our collective agreements. Um, if a government moves towards opening our collective agreements, yeah, they'll have those fights. I don't think they do well. Um, if, uh, you know, people were dealing with our pension plans, the Liberal government were dealing with our pension plans in a way that I didn't think was fair to our members. Um, if that were to happen again, of course. I mean, I'm not going to walk away from my principles. Um, but I will say this much. Um, I mean, already there's been uh, a fair amount of musing about the possibility of Dalton days or about selling he, off he infrastructure. took them off the table right away. Precisely. And, and what we did, though, so the labor movement actually went and, and spoke to the government. I've got a meeting coming up with all of the union leaders in Ontario and uh, the, the, um, uh, Dwight Duncan on January 21st. And again, it's all about sitting down to say, okay, can we talk about this deficit, obviously, which is a problem for everybody. Mm. Um, and rather than going into battle mode, can we talk about how we can do it in a mature way? How can we sit down and talk about uh, we want to preserve jobs, obviously, and they need to deal with the deficit. And how can we do that without getting into conflict? Let me pick up on a couple of the other things you mentioned. You did reference the case of the four men who a few weeks ago yeah. uh, plunged to their deaths in a quite appalling way, falling from that scaffolding here in Toronto. What would you like to see happen in that situation? Um, I called for, for a criminal investigation, right? Um, others have called for, like Pat Dillon from the construction trades, he's calling for a special investigator with a special panel. Now, the government have moved quite quickly in certain areas. They've got a coroner's inquest. They actually did put the case over to the police. So I'm sort of satisfied from the criminal end of it. If there was criminal activity stuck, t t had taken place that resulted in the deaths, um, that will be investigated. Um, you what, think someone needs to go to jail there? Well, I think, I think if we continue to kill people in the workplace in Ontario, um, there is a changes to the uh, Federal Act, um, Bill C C45. When the West Ray miners, were 26 of them were killed in Nova Scotia, the criminal code was actually changed to say that if an employer is responsible uh, in a criminal way for the, uh, for the, through negligence for the death of a worker, they can actually be charged under the criminal act. That came into place in, in 2004. We've not had one charge laid in Ontario, but yet every year we kill about 400 people on the job. So we ask the question, why is that happening? Why are we not using the criminal code? Um, surely the goodness in one of those cases in the last four or five years where there's been like 2,000 deaths basically, um, surely one of them had to be 
uh, due to negligence. Is the theory here that if somebody went to jail, the, the act would get I, cleaned up pretty well, quickly? Put it this way, I have a friend of mine who uh, actually is, is an employee who was in Michigan over the Christmas time, and he was driving down a highway, and he comes to the workman signs, and it basically said on there, kill a worker, go to jail. And that was like, whoa, that's a powerful message. I'm not saying we, that's what we need in Ontario, but we certainly need a message out there to employers that you've got a responsibility to make certain that if you bring in migrant workers, for example, or if English as a second language is a barrier, um, or safety equipment is not being given to workers, um, all of those factors could lead you to going to jail if that person loses their life on the job. You did mention that you and the CAW are going to be talking, and do you think at the end of the day you are going to get the Canadian auto workers back inside the OFL? I'm confident. <clears throat> yeah, it's no doubt about it. Um, the, the CAW membership and the leadership uh, know full well that um, we're all weaker when we're, when we're divided and when we're not talking to each other. And um, if we can get Ken and the CAW to come back in again, um, this organization, the OFL, has always been far more powerful when the CAW are, are, are part of our membership okay. base. That, that's one of the cleavages that you're dealing with. The other one, I guess, and we've heard a lot about this lately, particularly with the, the possibility for 10 minutes anyway that Dalton days were going to come in. Uh, you're, you, I guess when, in your previous life, you represented public sector workers. Mm -hmm. Now you're representing unionized people who are in public and private sector unions. Private sector unions, I don't have to tell you, have been hammered by this recession. Yes. Uh, way more than public sector employees, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. What do you do to try to create harmony there? Because no doubt there are public sector union people who are being looked at by private sector union people, uh, and the looks they're getting are not smiles, right? Um, I'm not so sure of that. I'm not so sure that, that union members are looking at union members and saying, you've got something that I don't have, like you've got job security, I don't have it. Um, I find, though, in the high-profile strikes that we've had in the city of Toronto, for example, or in Windsor, um, that issue was at play where, you know, politicians were able to turn the public against workers who were fighting for benefits that they already have, not new benefits, benefits that were already in their collective agreements. Or in the case of Windsor, they weren't even fighting for a benefit for themselves. They were fighting for a benefit for uh, post-retirement benefits for people beyond the age of 65. Um, I think they were, the, the, it was very easy to, get, to turn the public in this climate against public sector workers, given that the auto industry was flat on its back. And I wouldn't even say that Ken Luenza had a gun to his head. I'd say he had a cannon to his head. Um, and, you know, tens of thousands of jobs on the line. So Ken had to do uh, what no union leader wants to do, and that is to um, give a concession to save thousands of jobs and people's pension plans. Um, so I think some of the politicians use that very effectively to say, aha, the private sector unions had to give it up. Now you and the public sector better do the same. We had a bit of a discussion about that the other night. Mm -hmm. Can I play some tape for you? Absolutely. Because sure. I think your name came up, actually. Michael, mm -hmm. if you would, roll tape. I think labor leaders today are very sophisticated. I think they know the situation with regard to the economy. They know the challenges not only Ontario's having, but governments around the world are having. But let me just follow up here. You, you sounded very skeptical about the notion of that kind well, of meeting. Well, if I were Sid, and I, I do know Sid well and, and admire him greatly, uh, he would be uh, sitting there, and the first thing he'd say is, well, what about your own government? You just gave your MPPs a 25% raise. So if they try to save money and deal with deficit reduction and all of that by who knows what, but, but somehow dealing in the public sector either by you know, trying to make people take a pay cut or cut jobs or whatever, Who's, who's closer to being right there of those two? Um, in some respects, they're both correct. Um, we've got a saying in the labor movement right now that, you know, um, paying down the deficit won't create jobs, but creating jobs will pay down the deficit. So if we're going to come in right now and say we're going to undermine the stimulus package, which was designed to create jobs, and in the private sector primarily, and to keep some of the public sector jobs afloat, if we're now going to say we're going to pay down the deficit by eliminating some of those jobs out of the system, for example, um, then we're defeating the purpose uh, of the stimulus package. How about keeping the jobs but making people take a pay cut? Um, well, that's going to be on the table, there's no question. There's no doubt in my mind that will be on the table. And, you know, if it comes on the table, and that's part of the meeting I've got next week um, with Dwight Duncan and the Minister of Labour, um, you know, we'll then talk about what, what it is that they're looking for. Um, is there an appetite in the public sector to go out there and, and just cut their wages? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, we haven't seen, we haven't even had a discussion yet with the government. Uh, I'd be very surprised if there's going to be a whole bunch of union leaders in Ontario saying, Sid, go on in there and uh, tell this government you can cut our wages and that's the way we're going to deal with the deficit. Um, I don't think that's necessarily uh, going to happen. No, I hear you. Conversely, though, here's Andrew Steele writing uh, from Strategy Corp a government relations firm, on the Globe and Mail's website from a couple of months ago. Labor unions worked to defeat the NDP in 1995 and wound up electing Mike Harris. 
Facing a more dangerous foe, Labor again responded with a polarizing strategy of work refusals, general strikes and walkouts that resulted in a solidification of the PC party's base support and no noticeable reversal in public policy. Both times, overheated rhetoric and fiery pronouncements only served to make union leaders look dangerous and outside the mainstream of public opinion. Private sector employees watching at home didn't see someone who shared their values. They saw someone who was employing in-group rhetoric of us and them that put the petit bourgeois and non-unionized private sector worker workers clearly in the them category. You know, the gist of this here, I, I'm, I'm assuming the overheated rhetoric and fiery pronouncements, he might have been thinking about you in that case, because you've been known to indulge in some of that. Yeah. But do you, uh, how do you want to respond to the idea that your style in 95 got you worse than what you wanted, and if you try that again today, it may get you worse than what you want? Okay, I mean, I think it's a cynical view um, of what actually happened. You know, during the Mike Harris era, um, CUPE, you know, and that was the union I represented at the time, um, we grew by about 45,000 members during the Mike Harris years. In fact, I put out a press release saying that Mike Harris was CUPE's number one organizer. Um, they drove all kinds of people into the union movement. He tried amalgamations in the cities, for example, and gave everybody in the city an opportunity to opt out of the union, and likewise in the school boards. We scooped up every, every union member right across, every member in the, in the public sector in both of those sectors. Um, it, didn't, it didn't come through that if you give people um, an opportunity to vote non-union that they'll opt out of their unions. Um, in the terms of the, the, uh, the Ray government, I mean, that was within the hands of the Bob Ray government, how we dealt with unions in a social contract. And, um, you know, behind the scenes, we made all kinds of offers to Bob Ray um, that would have saved as much money, in fact, more money than what he was putting I on the table. I don't think he thought so, because he called you one of the four windbags of the apocalypse. Uh, well, he, so he yeah. did, but of course, he's a politician, and he's trying to, to you know, trying to, um, mind you, he wasn't saying that when he phoned me at home <laughs> and said, hey, Sid, can you come in and talk to no, us? he said well, that privately, that's yeah, true. Yeah, we're, we're going into an election, <laughs> and I really need your support, and would you mind coming down to my home and sitting down myself and Buzz Hargrove, and let's have a chat about how we go into the next election. So, of course, um, in great hindsight, he's now saying something different. By the way, that windbag is now a liberal. Um, he, at the time, he purported himself and to be he's not NDP. saying it now. Somebody, somebody, anyway, doesn't yeah. matter. Anyways, but no, the point was, though, I mean, he was the author of his own misfortune. Um, you would never see, for example, Mike Harris calling in the bankers in Bay Street and publicly telling them, we're going to take you on in the, in, in the, you know, in the public domain, and we're going to ask you to give up major concessions. Um, you know, you don't deal with your friends that way, and that's mm. the mistake that Bob Ray made. We tried to tell him behind the scenes that this is not going to work, Bob. And, um, but he plowed ahead because he felt, politically, he had to make this move to be able to appease Mike Harris, who was on the opposition benches. Mm. One of the things, we've got a couple of minutes left here, and then we're going to join the others on the other side of the studio and talk about whether green jobs can help save this economy. <clears throat> You've made green jobs a high priority. Mm -hmm. And when people think of green jobs today, I'm not sure they necess necessarily think about those being represented by labor unions. Why do you think there's no inconsistency there? Green jobs um, and labor unions. I'm not so sure people get a fully a full understanding of what green, jo green jobs actually mean. I think everybody believes it's all tied into uh, windmills, and, and that's a part of it. It's a big portion of it. In fact, the UK just only two days ago um, put a massive investment into building uh, windmill farms uh, off the uh, nine areas off the coast. Right. Um, what people don't understand is what goes along with that. For example, every turbine that sits on top of those towers, the tower's got 200 tons of steel in it that puts steel workers back to work. Um, the turbine itself has got 8,000 moving parts. If we had local procurement policies like by Ontario or by Ca Canada policies in place, we could be manufacturing those parts um, in their communities. You want to do that, though? Do we want to do that? You want to do that? Absolutely. So when the do Americans it. do it and exclude all of our goods, that's, that's oh, a good idea? The Americans, this is the thing. This is the folly of it all. The Americans have been doing it since 1945. And we're fighting it. No, hang on. They've got a, they've got a buy U.S. policy in place since 1945. And we're fighting it. And they've got a buy uh, state policy in place since 1982. This is a joke by the Canadian Manufacturers Association who are trying to create this illusion that if we maybe um, give up um, access to local procurement in Ontario um, that we'll, and, or in else, elsewhere in Canada, that we'll get access to this American market. And the question becomes, who will get access to this American market? How many corporations in Canada will have access, not necessarily to win the contracts, just to bid on the contract? And are we going to open up all of our manufacturing? Are we going to open up all of our local procurement policies to get access on a temporary basis for a, for a uh, stimulus package that's basically already spent? I mean, all the contracts have been committed. The American stimulus package? Absolutely. I don't think they've it's, spent a it's, third it's of it been, yet. It's been committed, though. And, and for us to try and now say that we want access to these markets and that somehow this is going to put Canada back to work is nonsense. Okay, you've got to start it here. If you would, join me on the other side of the studio and we'll continue the discussion about green jobs and whether they can help save our economy. Okay. Thanks, Sid.